Hello, everyone. Uh, oh, welcome yeah. to our next session of 24 Hours of UX. Uh, I hope you've had a great uh, time so far. I know I have. Um, uh, let us know in the chat where you're from. I think we're in the middle of the night over in Australia now, but maybe some of you are still here uh, enjoying um, the community of UX people. Um, right now we're in hour 15. And um, I know Johannes is, is running on coffee, basically, um, so far. Uh, <laughs> but we have uh, another great talk ahead, um, this time from uh, UX Graz, a local community here in Austria. Um, and I will hand over uh, the mic to Cornelia in just a second. Um, before we start, I'll just uh, let you run through um, how you can interact with our uh, hosts or with other guests here. Uh, you have uh, emojis on the bottom of the screen. You can send smileys and other reactions um, to Cornelia's post. Uh, you can also send messages here in the chat um, and uh, ask questions uh, in the Q&A session. There's an extra button next to the chat uh, on the right as well. Um, yeah, I think uh, that's it so far. Um, I will go and hide backstage and will reappear later. Um, and um, I'll hand over to Cornelia. Um, but before I start, I need to remember that this session is hosted by Parkside, um, which is very important because um, otherwise without the hosts and uh, our uh, sponsors, we couldn't actually uh, be here today. Uh, they're a a uh, software company that's, that has a very, very strong focus on UX here in Graz and Cornelia will actually post their job uh, uh, link in the chat and I think Johannes will, will uh, uh, pin it to the top. Uh, so if you're interested in, in, in working for a great company, uh, go check that out. And without further ado, uh, I will hide and Cornelia will give you an overview of what she learned in, in her experience career in UX design. Thank you so much, Niklas. Um, and, uh, oh, Johannes, you still want to say ah, something? Yeah, I'm, I'm still here. Uh, yes, uh, as soon as Connie finished her talk, uh, we will have an awesome interactive session with all of you in the audience. And uh, we want to uh, ha hand over one question uh, to yourself that you can take away and put your um, replies to that in the Q&A so we can uh, take you on stage or just put it into our fireside chat after Connie finished her talk. So the question is, what would you tell your younger self about UX education and um, I don't know, uh, things like this. Um, so I will be back on stage as soon as Connie. <laughs> finished her talk and now I go and grab another coffee. So I'm like this uh, Duracell uh, rabbit <laughs> somehow uh, back later. And Connie, the stage is all yours now. Thank you so much, Johannes. Go get some coffee um, in hour 15 now for you. Yes, uh, welcome. And yes, please ask. Um, we would like to ask the question also to you and put your answer in the Q&A. What would you tell your younger self um, if he would start your job now? Like what I wish I knew when I started as, in my case, as a UX designer. And this is my talk today. I will share my screen now. Just let me know if something is not working. Is it working? Oh, okay, perfect. Um, I'm so unsure because I don't see it. It makes me a bit nervous. You are live and your presentation is live as well. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Just to be sure. You also see it on the reactions that are coming on stage. Yeah, I know, I know. Thumbs up. I know what screen I'm sharing, like all the screens. Okay, thank you so much, Johannes. Right, let's start and I will try to keep in time. So, um, hi, I'm Connie. I'm a senior UX designer at Parkside and I studied at the FA Joanneum in Graz and I'm working as UX designer since uh, 10 years 
here you now. Um, I will talk a little bit about my UX journey and seven of the things that I would actually tell my younger self if I would start as a designer now. And I'd like to talk a bit about UX education in Austria, um, my work, the agile work that we did in the company, um, UX trainings that I did, a uh, bit of personal topic, but stress and mental health, uh, changing jobs, the UX grads community that we build up and how I finally then at the end got to teach others what I wanted to know in the beginning. All right, let's start. So education. First of all, where I studied is also where I'm living now and where I was born in Graz. I'm not expecting anyone to know where that is. So it's, it's right here. Um, it's a small student town, the second biggest city in Austria, which is not that big. Um, but yeah, a lot of students here and I studied at the FIU Neum, uh, University of Applied Sciences. Um, actually, I really liked um, studying there because it is more like a school. So you have fixed hours. It's not like a university where you can say, nah, I'll do that course next month or something. So that was very good for me. Fixed schedules. Also, the subjects were very diverse. Um, I, in my bachelor and master, I had subjects for branding, game design, web design, uh, graphic design, exhibition design, usability, and so on. So a lot of different subjects and basically everything was structured that you would have at the beginning of the semester. You would have like some theory lessons to the subject and then you would have one project that you would do either alone or in a group. And at the end of the semester, you would have to hand all the projects in. So this was when we all got very nervous. Um, but yeah, very diverse. So uh, good for me because I did not know what I wanted to do up to that point. And we already learned a lot of about self-management, about how to work with other people in groups. And yeah, education in Austria is also financed by the state. So this was good. And um, especially the University of Applied Sciences, there are a lot of corporations with companies um meaning we already were in contact with some of them what was not that good was because it was like a school but more hours um it was very difficult to work more than 15 hours uh, on the side so um that was about the maximum most of us just worked on the weekend and only 60 students were accepted in the bachelor I think I was number 427 when I applied. So it, the chances that you're getting in are, uh, yeah, not that high and in the master, it's only 18 people. But the good thing with this is um, that not like in the universities, you always know that you will have a spot, you will always have a, a professor to, to, um, to teach you. So, yeah, this is what I liked. It's also very, very personal. And after the bachelor, there was a mandatory internship that actually got me in contact with uh, usability a bit by mistake because it was 2008, the year of the financial crisis. And um, having a paid internship was not that easy. So I was thinking about doing an internship abroad, which did not work. So I was lucky to get an internship here in Graz at USP. Maybe Johannes uh, is here today. Um, one of the first disability companies in Graz, maybe even the first, I'm not sure now. And Hannes is now also organizing the World Usability Congress, which will be also in, um, in Graz in October, if you want to join. So that was my first official usability job. And then I got my real job. This was also a bit of an accident. I guess this is how it is with your, <clears throat> with your career. Sometimes things just happen by mistake. Um, my father actually sent me a link saying, look, 
in my company, they're searching for something that you studied. Um, I guess a lot of us have trouble explaining to their parents what they're actually doing. Um, and I thought, okay, let's have a look. And it was a usability engineer. And I read through the description, I thought, yeah, yeah, okay, that looks like something that I studied. Yeah, actually, right. Um, the only thing that got me worried a bit was I should be able to program in WPF and XAML, so Windows Presentation Foundation. Um, and I had a lot of programming or different programming languages I learned in the university, but this was completely new, but luckily I never actually needed it. So, yeah. But then I started to work in a very big B2B company, um, in an automotive company. Um, and it was actually right after university. So the company has had about, now it has more than 10,000 employees and more than 20 really big software products that actually partly work. Um, you can imagine it like in Adobe Creative Suite, so all the products needed to work together. And there are about 46 HR teams all over the world, Graz, Germany, US, Zagreb, India, Minsk, and so on. <clears throat> So I was very happy when I came to this really big company um, that I had a mentor, actually, um, Stefan Lehnhardt, who did the job as a usability engineer before me. He was promoted to be a product manager and was there also to, to mentor me. And oh my God, did I find out how little I actually knew about working. Um, although, I knew how all the tools worked. I knew how to export, um, I don't know, whatever files. I had a lot to learn. And for example, I was surprised. I never actually learned how the product development process looks like, right? I had programming, I had design, I learned um, how to do the, the concept but everything kind of separated and never in, in a complete picture. Um, then suddenly I was confronted with a lot of roles and responsibilities. PM, GPM, PL, a content manager, a development owner, MVT or C. And I was like, what, what, what is happening? Um, so I had to learn to talk the same language, first of all, and that was the easiest for me, um, understanding the developers and testers, um, understanding product management, um, the complete automotive jargon, of course, uh, what is the ECU, what is the XU, and so on. And then also understanding, of course, the product that I would be responsible for. Oh, luckily, there were tests. So uh, um, there were uh, trainings that we also offered to the customers. So I, I was good to go there. Um, but yeah, what surprised me a lot was the, I'm now straightforward calling it bullshit bingo. Um, it was a lot of words that meant everything and nothing um, and so many abbreviations. Um, and in the first few meetings, I thought everybody else was speaking Spanish. So I felt every two seconds I should ask, um, what is that? Who is that? What does it mean? What does it stand for? Um, but after some time, I found out that actually, sometimes when I asked, others also didn't know, but nobody dared to ask. Um, a colleague of mine, <laughs> he actually made a, let's call it a test. Um, he had a presentation to upper management and he was re, um he was presenting how uh, i think the product vision for his um product and why it was better than the competition and he would say on every second slide he would say um and here we also have to think about the mbtuc factor uh, plus 12 and so on, and he would calculate that. Da, da, I translated this from German, so it's not the exact same thing, but yeah. 
And maybe you also notice that you sometimes do this yourself, that you just accept abbreviations and you just don't ask anymore because you're just overwhelmed. This is how I felt at some point. And I also put it in here. So got you if you didn't question it anymore. Um, if you did, very good. Because what it actually meant um, at the end of the presentation, there was one colleague in the audience and he said, uh, I'm sorry, I'm new here. Actually, I'd have a question. What is the MBTOC factor? And the colleague said, very good that you're asking. MBTOC stands for much better than a competition factor. So the whole, um, actually all the numbers in the presentation made very, very little sense. But yeah, just that I just love this story because it explained so very well how we are sometimes intimidated by others um, and maybe we don't have to be, we should just ask. Um, one of my first projects was um, redesigning the software product that I was responsible for. I felt very safe there, it was designed, I knew how to, how to design, so I was very happy. And then I looked around and saw the other software products that we, um, were, we, we also produced, and all of them looked different. And I thought, wait, 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 we are calling this suite. I thought it's like an Adobe suite, why is everything looking different? And I went to the marketing director and he said, why is everything looking different? I said, I don't know, I'm only responsible for this one product, but shouldn't they all look the same? And he said, I thought they did. And I said, no, they don't. So my first task um, together with our external company, um, we they created like a design guide, like 12 pages, how, how the software should look like. Um, of course, this wasn't enough. Um, so based on this, I actually created a design system, including component libraries, icon graphic libraries um, that were then accessible for all products. And this got me um, connected with a lot of other departments because we we're also discussing how the different um, logos were looking like for the products and so on. Um, so I luckily got in touch with a lot of different people from a lot of different departments, which was very important because in this big company, um, knowing people is, is like half your job. Um, this is why I would also give you one advice. Um, for me, it was cake. Um, I love baking and I actually get sad when I see people eating alone and I always want to include everyone. So I just went through the whole floor um, into every office and I invited everyone to cake. Um, and in the beginning, I didn't know, oh, the people in these offices, no, they belong to the other department. We don't talk to the people from the other departments. Um, and this connected me to a lot of different people because I just didn't know. And you just found out so much about ongoing projects, um, how you can help each other out. Um, other departments were sometimes working on the same thing that you are working, but management maybe didn't talk or there was just communication break. And actually most of the smartest projects were started over coffee and cake or pizza and beer a little bit later. So, yeah. And I also figured out that as a UX designer, you're like the social glue in the project. Like I always found myself in the middle of developers, uh, testers, management and the user. So, um, like this bringing people together aspect is something that I would warn my younger self also, this is something you have to do. So if, if there's some days where you're feeling like you don't want to talk to people today, it's not that easy when you're a UX designer. Then the agile came. Um, one year after I joined, actually the, the HR process was rolled out within the teams and everybody had to do an HR training. So I had the scrum training and I came back inspired with all the possibilities. Like I remember walking into the coffee kitchen and sharing all the principles that I learned and the ideas. And I just heard, 
yeah, we had the training a while back, but that's just theory. That's not how we actually work. And yeah, I was a little bit disappointed by that. Um, and then a bit later, there was another new process that would work over these um, HL teams. It was a form of SAFE, which I didn't know. Um, but yeah, it was actually, um, it were five sprints. Uh, there was a release planning meeting. I finally met all the 110 developers that I um, was working with. I was a UX team of one at that point. Um, and it, it, it was crazy to see all, all the people in real life um, coming together, all the stakeholders. And they also saw for the first time um, what I was doing because each of the stakeholders and developers, they would just send me a mail or come to my office and just give me tasks like this. And it was actually never visible um, what I was doing and uh, what were the priorities. So this for me, I loved it, right? Uh, it added a lot of transparency. A lot of developers were not that big of a fan change. Um, it was maybe not that thought out, right? We just started to implement it. But for me, it was amazing because, yeah, like the, the transparency and that all the people finally saw, wait, these are a lot of tasks and yeah, we need to prioritize and so on, um, was really good. And there were like three HL mistakes that I made. Um, and that I learned now that I will do better. I only plan now 40% of my time. You will not manage more, or at least I did not. Um, I then planned with Kanban. I only put the crucial and time relevant tasks um, into the sprint and committed to them and the rest which is prioritized in backup. And what I found myself um, having trouble with was the planning blackmailing. Um, people would come to me and I was, you know, I was quite young and they would ask me, um, could you do this concept? And I said, yeah, mm, actually, I already have like five concepts to do. Um, yeah, you know, development will start with or without you, like with concept or without concept. And I just saw, oh crap, if they start without concept, it will be so much more work um, later on. So, of course, I can, I can fit it in somehow. So this... Um, this didn't work out so well, so be aware of that. Um, when I then said finally no, um, we got more resources, which I will come to later. Um, one good thing that also came out with the HL initiative were the UX trainings that we could do out of the design CUP. I'll let you read that. <clears throat> so the words UX, UI, easy to use, usability, um, they were always on some presentations, but actually not really used in a in in the right way. And people sometimes just ask me, oh, are you the new icon lady? And I'm like, uh, yeah, but I also do something else. And then we had, um, we created this UX basic training, um, Stefan and me, and it was a voluntary one-day training, um, hands-on, and I focused a lot on the terms, uh, why research is important, so the half of the day was only research, then uh, the UX process, and actually they had to hands-on um, work on the whole UX process, and this slide was like something that I focused a lot on, why skipping research is so expensive, um, sorry, I'm always getting wound up here. Then I explained the user-centered design process uh, on the example of a home automation that they had to design themselves, they had to interview them, uh, each other, um, make personas, sketch something, also test these sketches. And to explain this, this is one of the examples I love to use, um, I had this tiny hands-on session as a user, I need a collecting container with a handle and three holes. This is your requirement and now design something. Um, these felt a bit like the requirements I got. Um, it was like, we need five more columns in this grid. And I'm like, 
what for? What's the grid for? What are you doing? Um, there will now be 15 columns in there. It's not readable anymore. Which one can I remove? I said we need five more columns in this grid. Uh, okay, so think what you would do as a sketch for this. Um, one, two, three. Yeah, probably it would be something like this. Um, I did this now in my last remote workshop. Um, could be anything, could be any size. Most of the time it was something like a garbage can container or something. Um, and actually what the user would have needed was, yeah, first of all, the user story and the persona probably, but um, what you would actually have needed was, was this um, egg separator. I don't know if that's also the English word, where you separate the yolk from, from the white. Uh, I don't know if it's the most useful tool, but anyway, this is what the user wanted. So, what was good with this training is that it was actually spreading the word. People were um, actually correcting each other, like, I think you mean UX and not UI. Um, so, we talking a bit the same language. They were contacting us earlier. I heard very often, oh, that's what you do. And maybe my manager should have been in the training because when developers or testers were in the training, they said, hmm, actually a lot of this is for before uh, or important for the earlier process. And I said, yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, all right, so, and like I said, the, our UX team grew. So this is also something that I had to learn how we are then with this bigger team um, managing to align because as a UX designer, in, when you're a UX team of one, you do not have to align anything. This is the only positive thing. Um, and so we found this, this structure and um, it took some time and we iteratively tried to improve um, our alignment. So we had a core team um, and they, uh, we had a daily with the core team inside the segments that a daily and so on. So that was um, something that we worked out. And something that was a bit harder for me was learning how to delegate. Um, this, this was also not that easy for me in the beginning. And yeah. So for the first, um, the first four things that I wish I knew, ask questions. Don't be afraid to look stupid. The software development process, all the roles and responsibilities. Um, and if I would start again at the company, I always told myself UX should just be treated like development. Um, there are so many things that developers already have figured out. Um, and sometimes when you come to a company where the UX maturity is not that high, it's like, no, 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 you go play alone in the corner and we do the real stuff with the developers. Um, and don't let yourself be pressured and use uh, Agile for your benefit, for the stuff that you need, like uh, transparency and so on. And also share your knowledge. Don't be a guru. Be helpful and include people in the mystery of UX. It was very common in the company that I was in um, before that I know something, this means that I'm important and that's why I'm not sharing information. And this is not very helpful when you want to spread the word. Um, and also on the more private side, like I mentioned before, um, stress and mental health. So uh, two sentences that really helped me when I was feeling a lot of stress is um, there's nothing that you actually have to do except dying. <laughs> this was something that Stefan told me. It may sound weird in English, um, but uh, actually I always said, okay, I have to finish this. I have to do this. I have to, I have to, I have to. Um, this was already putting a lot of pressure on me. Um, and the same, the same with the second sentence that he told me, like, well, I think it was actually my father. He said, what's the worst that could happen, right? If you're not done with the concept. And I thought, yeah, I'm, I'm not a doctor. Nobody will die if the concept is a day late, right? So that really helped me. And what I'm still working on, but I at least have my methods. Um, I avoid using words like stress or I have to. I learned to say 
no, I'm really bad at that. But at least I'm questioning deadlines now. And I say I can do it, but maybe next week. Um, I try to ask for help. I ask my team lead now at Bike said, look, we need maybe more time. I need more resources or whatever. And I try to find rituals when I'm leaving work. Like I put everything on a post-it or in my calendar or somewhere. Um, so I don't take the work home and can mentally leave it somewhere. And also, I can only do a good job when I'm feeling well. Um, this is something that I just learned this year. Honestly, I always had a bad conscience when I would do something for myself and or when I needed a break. And actually, you can't be good if you're not feeling good. So also for your company, it is very important that you are feeling well because, for example, I started meditating every day, 10 minutes. When you're really stressed, 10 minutes of meditating is like the hardest thing ever. Um, but after two or three days, I felt so much more productive just because I took this 10 minutes for myself. So take the time for yourself and you will be more productive. Um, but all of this actually did not help in my own company. So I had to follow the advice that my husband always gives me. And it's so easily said, but it's so hard to do. Um, love it, change it or leave it. Um, because I was in a tricky position in my old company. I felt like I had all the responsibilities, but I could not change the things that I needed to change to fulfill my responsibilities. So it was like a uh, tight spot. And then I started to work at Pikeside. So I changed jobs and Pikeside is also a company in, in Graz. They, we are 70 people. Um, and the first thing that I noticed, no matter what job the person had, um, they knew about GX and what it meant. And this was so different. Um, even uh, the, the, the CEO, we, we were in a meeting and I remember someone said, yeah, you just do your uh, usability or UUX based on your, your gut feeling. And before I could say something, the CEO said, well, wait, wait. it's not a, um, or one of the partners, he said, uh, UX is not a gut feeling. It's actually science. And I was like, was that just coming from management? Um, yeah. Anyway, I, I was just like really, um, really happy when I came into this new environment and I'm now working in a very, in actually a design team that is bigger than in my old company, um, where there were more than 10,000 people. Um, and we're now 70 people and the design team is bigger. So we have now 11 design experts. Um, and all of them are experts in different areas, which is really nice because that means that you can learn from others who are experts in branding, where I'm really bad at and stuff like this. Um, but change is hard. It was so hard for me um, to jump um, over my own shadow. I don't know if that's also saying in English, um, because I had to learn so many new things again. And it started with the little things, switching from Windows to Mac, um, very, very hard. Um, learning a completely new design process. Um, this is actually not correct anymore. We will switch to Figma now. Um, so learning again, a new tool. And, uh, but we were finally talking about the right things. We were talking about things like design ops and I didn't talk about uh, I didn't have to talk about why um, research was important for half my time, I felt. And also the learning culture in general is, is very good. So we have regular design excellence workshops to a specific topic where we are sharing knowledge from a different areas of expertise. And within the design CUP, we get time to educate ourselves, maybe with trainings, books, and then we share the knowledge. And company-wide, there are also academy talks where everyone, developers, designers, QA, would talk about new and interesting topics from their area. So everyone learns from each other. Um, also in my spare time, thanks to Johannes, who pushed me a little bit to 
to support there um, and to have a talk. Hi, Johannes. <laughs> um, 2019, he asked me, do you want to have a talk um, at UX Graz? And I said, I was just feeling brave because I just switched jobs and I thought, how hard can that be? Um, sure, let's, let's give a talk. And I found out um, there are others like me, um, like so many people had the same struggles that I have or had like two years ago. And there were so many things that we could learn from each other. Um, and uh, Johannes also encouraged me to, um, do you want to do something? And I said, yeah, you know, I'm the social type. Um, I'd like to do the UX book club. And we now, this is the only good thing about working remotely in Corona. Um, Cliff Kuang, for example, would join us for our next a remote book club and I'm like really excited and this would not happen if you would like meet in person. Um, yeah, so to the second part, what I learned now in the second stage of my life was you don't have to do anything, take care of yourself, embrace change. It's never too late and don't be afraid to learn new things. Um, and there are others like you so find find your communities get inspired by the things and share your story and connect with others and there's now only one more chapter and sorry then johannes we are at the talk and fireside chat i'm i'm hurrying um because the last part of this presentation is when i could finally um teach what i would have loved to um to know when i started because we had this um, school, they approached us and said, um, hey, we have a technical focus, we are specializing on UX, um, and would, would you care to teach us a little bit, show us how you're working? And we came up with three sessions of two hours long. And my plan was in these three sessions, I would teach, so six hours in total, I would teach these kids everything that I know and the complete process from start to finish. Mm, a bit tricky, maybe. <clears throat> but I'll show you some slides and I'm going to be fast because this is basically also how their um, workshop looked like. Maybe not that fast. But yeah. So here's some slides, what I, what I showed them. Um, I showed them what, what, what are we actually doing? When you're in a software company, what does it mean? What uh, type of roles are there? Um, then I told them what, what does a team look like? And I already preached a little bit like 50% of your time spent on defining what you're doing and only 50% on doing it. So no, start early. Um, then I told them how the, the software process actually looks like, how uh, when UX should be involved very early. Um, I also told them what different kind of experts we, for example, have, because there's so many different titles for us designers. And I said, we, for example, we differentiate into branding experts. We then have UX designers. Uh, most of us are UX designers, but we also have UI designers. And then I told them, you are going to design a complete product now. Um, and I went through this user-centered design, uh, user -centered design process again with the example of a soap shop. I explained what research is. I showed them my interview cheat sheet um, and explained a little bit about that. Uh, also everything hands-on and so on. And I created a fake customer. The fake customer was called Little Soaps. I'm making soaps myself. So I just saw some soaps and thought, aha, uh -huh, okay, this is going to be the customer. Within two hours, I had like fake customer, fake persona, fake requirements, very bad branding. I'm sorry for all the actual designer designers out there. Um, and I started with hands-on tasks like look around um, what is actually um, normal in a web shop. How should, what are the standards? Then I asked them, uh, I showed them how to do task flows based on requirements. What is an information architecture? And I asked them to do it and they actually manage. And then that got me even more motivated. So in the next workshop, I also told them, you know, what is uh, happening behind the scenes, like 
okay, you now have your mapping of your research, you now need to verify it with developers and customers and so on. Um, so everything that you maybe don't think about um, because you're not working alone as a designer. <laughs> then I showed them how to start with a concept and I said, okay, I'm always studying um, and it's actually very good to always start with pen and paper. And they asked me, paper, isn't that a bit old school? And first I felt really old. And <laughs> then I um, explained to them, no, if you're going into a design tool, you know, you're already limiting yourself and so on. So please start with pen and paper. And I showed them how to sketch. We made some methods from the design sprint so that they would get into sketching. Then I focused on navigation and hierarchy because I think this is uh, the two things that mostly fail in products. Um, then I showed them how to make paper prototypes and how to test them. And they actually did it. They created mockups, um, some with balsamic, but some also with paper. <laughs> they were complaining a bit, but they did it with paper. And in the last session, I told them everything about UI. What is a design system? Um, then also about the usability heuristics, the requirements, so the not so fun stuff that I actually love. So going somewhere, being in the conference. Um, and then I showed them how I started with the UI design. And I gave them some resources and they actually created UI design. They created, uh, I said, you have to create three screens. They created like um, way more and they also made like a little style guide on the side. So yeah, I was really, really happy with this outcome and that I could finally share what I would have wanted to know before I started to work as a UX designer. That's it. So Johannes, it only took me 12 minutes longer. It's totally fine. I think you shared something that I, should have asked you before, by the way, I, I never realized um, how you managed to get into the job because it's a totally different way uh, than I took. Um, I studied musicology, uh, was in a technical school before uh, on the construction uh, engineering and uh, just managed to jump in like um, self-studied uh, software development and uh, fell into UX somehow. <laughs> so. <laughs> A totally different way. Um, yeah, I actually never asked you to, so now <laughs> it's it's great to uh, talk to each other, right? <laughs> we're such a good community. <laughs> we're, we're the best community ever, um, and and I uh, think you really shared some great insights. And maybe since we had a mirror board on the usability heuristics and some other stuff, you could share the links on our event mirror board here so people find it afterwards and look it up. I think uh, some of the people here would be interested in uh, where and how we share our knowledge uh, within our community to others. So probably you can share the link there. Are you asking me? Yeah. Oh, I have to look in the camera. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my screen is looking at, at Nicola's direction. Okay, it's fine. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I, I hit all my links. Sorry, Johannes, you have to share. Yeah, I, I will share it uh, somewhere later on the mirror board. Yeah. And uh, by the way, if uh, someone recognized Nico, um, surprisingly uh, introducing Patrick, he's our, um, he's one of the listeners who has been to, um, I think almost each and every of our sessions from UX Graz up to now. And it's amazing to see you here. So you're really part of our core community team. And uh, without people like him, uh, we would not uh, do this with, yeah. at, at least not with this engagement level. Um, UX Graz, the, the core team from these four people, two people are from Graz, one from <laughs> Nico from Munich and Amy from uh, the US. So we're, so, we're great. Great pointing. And uh, I just scroll through the uh, things that we wanted to know. Uh, but before, there was a question on the poll votes. And most of the people, interestingly, uh, come from a graphic design background, uh, which is not surprising. Uh, but to some, um, to s some uh, degree, it is surprising because I always thought more people come from the interaction design um, field to uh, UX. And, 
Oh, there's still uh, votes counting. Yeah, I um, just voted because I didn't know that it was there. Yeah, I, I can't vote. Um, I would have to deal something else, which is not there. So whatever. But um, more uh, interesting, um, we have some uh, questions in the Q&A, but we have a moderator. I don't have to do this right now. Yes. Nico. No, you, you can you can relax, sit back, and um, I'll I'll handle the questions. Give me a second while it's loading. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe get some more coffee. Um, I'll I'll go by most uploaded, and here uh, uh, the most uploaded question is, or it's more of an answer basically uh, to the question of how or what you would tell yourself as, as a young person getting into UX design. And uh, Frane, I'm not sure how to pronounce your name, I'm sorry, um, said that he would tell himself that he should get into UX sooner, um, which I think is a good idea. Uh, UX, we also need always need a lot more people who um, let the user be part of the design process. Um, and uh, somebody else said that uh, they should not underestimate the importance of UX research. I, as a UX researcher, agree. Um, yes. <laughs> and Cornelia's, Cornelia's talk also has a lot of UX research parts. Um, good. Uh, and we have a question from Joanna, uh, which is, how do you distinguish yourself as a UXer from others, uh, from graphic design, who just know how to make nice designs as opposed to making something that's actually usable by a user. Um, maybe Cornelia can start. Yes. Um, actually, we had once a UI designer, external one, who would um, um, make for us icons and graphic design. And once someone asked me, like without our involvement, um, now asked him, could you just make the UI for this? And for me, um, this this went really bad because nobody told him about the research, what the product needs, what it does, what the user needs. And so it was very flawed in my opinion, um, but it was not really his fault because he was just not provided this information. So for me, the biggest, difference would be that a UI designer for me just comes um, the part of UI design. It could be that it's the same person. I did it also as one person, as a UX team of one, I did everything. Um, but the UI design is something that comes after you decided uh, layout and navigation and hierarchy and whatever, and after you did your research. So. Mm -hmm. I just jump on on that uh, because um, I, I you, just you also mentioned that you just changed jobs and that you finally found a company that uh, values UX as much as you do. Um, and I was wondering, uh, and I think a lot of people here were wondering as well, like how did you make that decision? How did you know that this is a good fit for you and this is a company that fits your own values of putting the user first? you make sure that they, um, they bring to the table? Oh, yeah, that, that, that is um, actually, I, I was surprised how, how that worked then at the end because I wasn't actually looking for a new job. I, I got approached and they said, just, you know, that our office is not so far from your office, just come over for a coffee. And I went there and I talked with them and I just, so, okay, not only when I was talking to the designers, also when I was talking to HR, when I was talking to the partner, um, to the, uh, one of the bosses, um, we, we were talking the same language uh, from the beginning. And it was so different and I just left. I, I remember walking out after this first coffee and it was actually, this office and my old office is actually on the same street. So I walked out, I looked in the direction of my old company and I just had this tight feeling. And then I turned around to the new company and I was like, 
yeah, this is the place I just want to go to every day. So it was it was really a, a gut feeling. Does it make sense? Okay. But yeah. it was so yeah. difficult. I, it was still uh, such a difficult decision. Mm -hmm. Good. Sounds like sounds like you made the right one for you, and you're you're happy. Um, speaking of speaking of being happy, I always remember a memorandum of cake, and you you said that something you do to get to know your colleagues is bring cake to the office, which is kind of hard now because all the people are working from home. You just changed jobs. Were you changing jobs during the the pandemic? Um, how did how did you? manage to like connect to your team even though you were remote uh yeah that's a good question luckily i'm social and i like to drink so we had like evening events um uh, we had like mario kart uh online sessions we had um among us sessions mm -hmm. um so we we just tried to find ways to connect and actually in the beginning, I felt way more connected to my colleagues because normally when you're studying in a company, you are not talking to your new colleagues from seven in the evening till 10 at night. Um, but when you're playing Mario Kart, um, the, the drinking version, um, you would be yeah, talking to your colleagues actually more. Um. One of the questions that I, I just saw scroll by was, will you be sharing your slides? Uh, as far as I know, the sessions are recorded, so at least there will be a YouTube version of Cornelia's presentation. Is there a different way to access your slides? Maybe Johannes has an idea. Um, actually, uh, if the recording is put online, or as soon as the recording is put online, we will uh, put also a link to the slides uh, if they're available online somewhere. Um, we are uh, at the moment figuring out if and how we also could provide some kind of Google Drive or something to put other uh, stuff that can be downloaded um, from any attendees uh, there. But we will uh, let you know, so just follow the 24 hours of UX um, and you will get notified um, so uh, hopefully you find everything there. And uh, since we we had to to um, open this up, or we we decided to open it up as a kind of fireside chat, and maybe also invite people on stage, um, I would say we just quickly um, announced that uh, people can uh, now prepare for uh, the next session, which will start in about uh, seven minutes. Um, which is on, I don't have the schedule here, but uh, Nikki, I, maybe. I have it. Yes. It's okay. Dallas, Dallas UX, Designing Curiosity. Um, so we're switching over to a different continent. Um, but if you want to stay here and uh, talk to us, you're, you're very welcome. Yeah, there's so many interesting questions in the in the Q&A. Um, and, and I think it's not only the questions, it's also something that people mentioned on uh, what they would have uh, told their younger selves about uh, what what to uh, mention. So uh, when I read the chat and there was suddenly something appearing in a different language, I was like, I need to learn other languages. Uh, we, we had the discussion in the UX cocktail um, last time because it's not only the um, language that you learn, but also the uh, culture, uh, cultural backgrounds that you uh, get insights into when uh, talking about other languages. And uh, probably that's something that is really important um, to any UX designer out there. So um, if you get the chance and have time, go get out, uh, get insights on different cultures, on different languages to understand the people, the users that you're designing for. It's not only about you. It's not only about uh, learning the hard skills like design tools, like um, different methods. It's uh, really learning about culture and people. And that's, uh, I think, basically what uh, I would tell my younger self to really go uh, get insights, learn from people. Mm. And I, I did that a lot, so I would not tell myself because I'm doing it a lot anyway, but travel. Um, and for me, it was, uh, for example, Asia is for me um, like my most interesting destination because it's so far away sometimes with with the tiniest things, like in 
uh, Saigon. It took me about three days that I was able to cross the streets by myself because I was really scared because of all the traffic. Um, so the tiny things like this, they uh, just make you, yeah, just open your mind. So yeah. good point. That's really, and it's really amazing. And I, I think that's also something that's happening right here, right now in the 24 hours of UX. You have people from all around the globe uh, joining in here. Just uh, go talk to them uh, via private message, uh, networking, speed networking uh, on tables, in the chat, uh, go to the mirror board, pick up some LinkedIn accounts and talk to them and learn from each other. Um, you mentioned it in your um, talk earlier, ask questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Even if they might sound dumb to you when asking, they might be really important. Uh, that's something that um, I figured out um, in the company I'm working for at the moment, that people are using passwords all the time and don't even know what they're saying. Smart so, synergies, it's my favorite. <laughs> no, nobody knows. <laughs> N nobody knows um it also this is from christiane moser here be curious and never stop asking questions uh in particular why this is really good like um why yeah, yeah. <laughs> like especially when you're coming new into a company and you see everything with with your fresh eyes right and you're like what why is the product doing that why I don't know why does the installation of the product take five hours? Is it really necessary? Um, these um, these whys are just really really important. Yeah. I'm I'm just reminded about one of our uh, UX grads uh, meetup types that we have, which is like fucked up, making mistakes. And have you ever had uh, an interaction with somebody where asking a question like backfired? That, that has that ever happened to you or have you only had good good reactions to, to ask? yeah in one of my interviews i told this also in my last talk it was very weird and i don't know what went wrong um typically when i'm doing the same structured interviews when i'm talking about tasks i ask like um what part of your tasks like what is the what do you prefer to do? Like, what are your favorite tasks and which ones do you like to, you know, do a little bit later or, and I just asked like, what are your favorite tasks? Um, and I got back something like, um, do you also want me to ask me about my favorite color or if I like walks on the beach? And I was like, what? <laughs> um, uh, what flowers do you prefer? Uh, uh, well, what, what, what happened? I never had that that response in, I don't know, I did the same question, um, I don't know, about 50 times and then suddenly it was weird. Hmm. <laughs> Just a quick reminder in the middle, um, you can either stay with us and uh, you can also uh, raise your hand and we will uh, get you on stage or in about a minute or two, the next session will start. We already uh, said that, but we will uh, stay here uh, online a little longer as long as you stay online with us and um, are more than happy if you uh, note uh, something on chat that you want us to talk about or just raise your hand and we get you on stage and you can just be uh, part of the stage experience right here. Um, I would love to answer this one question. Yeah, yeah go. do it. Um, how, how to create a design system when you're alone? <laughs> how would I go about creating a design system if I'm the only UX designer in the company? Um, this is a great question. So I started with um, mini style guides, right? I saw that there were mistakes that were made all the time. Uh, error messages were wrong. Um, keyboard navigation was wrong um menus were wrong naming text whatever so i created like a, a, the first thing i did was like a six page pdf um where i described the main things please don't do that um or please do that and then i developed from there and then i put it in confluence i um started slowly with the most important things and just grew from there but honestly, I had to do this because we were um, using this um, 
all of our software products were using a different programming language, which meant that we had to have like our own mix of design system. But if I would be alone, I would say depend on a design system that is already there. We also referenced very heavily um, because we're doing Microsoft closed products. Um, we referenced Microsoft a lot and the Microsoft guidelines. So take something, um, take a design system that is existing and just note down where you're deviating. That's how I would start. Yeah, in, in our company, for example, um, I try, uh, since I'm the uh, lonesome UX uh, unicorn um, <laughs> riding in the dark, also doing some um, development on the front end still, even though Connie always tells me to stop developing because we have enough developers. Um, I always told my developers, like, I'm not starting. Yeah. You're like 400 people, I'm alone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but um, anyway, um, I I uh, started to to introduce uh, the material design uh, because it's something that I've worked uh, in the past um, already, and I really know uh, a lot about it. And um, it's not for every system, but since uh, we are not into uh, Mac or uh, uh, iOS or something, uh, I think it works out pretty well. Uh, even for for Windows uh, users, it's uh, pretty handsome. So. We can use it for most of those, our systems, and that's um, where I use it as a basis and just try to define things that we do uh, not according to the material design system. Since it's easier to take something that is already existent and maybe rearrange it based on some research that you can do, so you do small steps and uh, really do some customization on the stuff. And uh, that's a way uh, or the other way to go um, to just use a base and then reinvent things in small steps. So uh, you don't start with a small system, you start with a large system, but to change it stepwise in the other way around. And I think that's um, also a kind of approach. It's different to the one that uh, Connie mentioned, but it can work out. You never reach a, a system, a real system on your own, since you're always based on the main system that you started with. Yeah, so. but it's, it's a crazy amount of work. So um, actually, I when I left the company in 2000, end of 2019, um, there were about four people working on this design system, um, probably half time or something, because it's just a crazy amount of work and it's always growing and it's a living thing, right? So um, it, it never stops. So to do this by yourself, you really need to have some some tricks, right? So. And um, one slide in, in your presentation was uh, really something that uh, reminded me of, you mentioned the mental health, but I was uh, thinking about the actual health and um, I don't know why, but uh, it reminded me of uh, telling the audience um, if you ever come to a point when someone asks you to organize a 24-hour non-stop uh, event, don't do it. It's really bad for your health. You, you get stressed out all the way long, uh, but it's worth this. it. You also mentioned that getting in touch with people, sharing your knowledge is uh, some part of UX design and some part of the really great uh, uh, journey that I took on uh, this way to be a UX designer. So um, I don't know if I should just recommend it or not. <laughs> a little bit uh, in between uh, the seats here, but um, I think uh, I, I stay with it and do it next year again, if I will be asked. But since I'm on the direct support, I might <laughs> not be asked, just pushed in there. All right. There's so many other questions, Wait, I, I just at least want to read them. Um, I'm transitioning from fashion textile print field into UX and prepping portfolio and case studies. I don't think there's a perfect portfolio and you will need to stop at some point and get ready for jobs. But what's your thought on this? Thanks. Uh, Connie, take this one and uh, please explain me what the best UX portfolio has to look like because I don't have one my own and mm -hmm. I need to prepare one. Um, yeah, I, I did some interviews with um, some job interviews. What I what I like is 
I actually don't care. It could be a PDF. It could be a, a, a could be a website. Um, I don't really care about the, the format. I I prefer to have two two good piece of works in two two work pieces in there than having twenty mediocre ones and stuff that you could talk about, right? Where you really thought, okay, this was a problem and this is how I solved it. Um, I had a bit of an issue when I was changing jobs because I couldn't really share a lot because a lot of it was confidential. Um, so I had had a similar issue. So I, I just took designs, um, made them again, but in a completely different context and made like my own Spotify or something. Um, just that people saw I could work with with the tools and also saw um, a tool question in there. Actually, for me, it doesn't matter if you know Sketch or XD or if you know um, Figma, you can learn everything, right? I learned to go from XD on Windows to Sketch on Mac. I felt, <laughs> I felt like my grandma using a PC. It was like, and I closed the program and this happened and yeah. So, you, you can learn everything and okay i should probably not say this and i hope that my none of my students are somewhere here in still but um when i got my mac laptop i didn't know how to turn it on this <laughs> tiny black um the ux is not good and i'm sorry the mouse the mouse is charged on the bottom okay now no, i'm done <laughs> Okay, uh, I think uh, since now you quit your job, uh, we probably have to get you another one. Uh, <laughs> now I know how to turn it on. But uh, back to the to the original question about the X portfolio, what I've seen a lot, and I think that it's really something that uh, you should um, highlight in your your X portfolio. If you do do one, and I will plan to do it, I planned it for years. Um, do not only put the result on it. Um, don't focus, as you mentioned, don't focus on the tools that you're using. Don't focus on uh, the output and the outcome. Uh, probably better put the focus on uh, what was the problem? What was the way there? How did you achieve it? Which method and why? That you also see, okay, I did it. I did the process and I didn't just right. go copy paste it from and, some. And and again, the question, why? Why did you do this? So ask yourself why and uh, put it down. Because if there are really experts um, in the committee, in the uh, job uh, interview, they might ask you why. Because it's a really common question in the field of UX. And if you can't tell them why you chose a certain meta method um, within your design, even it's, if, if it's a, a kind of a fake design that you just put up for your portfolio and that's really common uh, in the field of UX, but always uh, put down a note or uh, explain uh, what problem you try to solve, what method you chose and why. So people get to know you and that you understand what you're doing. And even if you're a uh, junior, uh, in the junior level and maybe do some courses on uh, like uh, Coursera or uh, the Interaction Design Foundation or some uh, other resources or some certificates. And you're really learning everything from the scratch. And uh, also there you find some side notes and uh, really read between the lines why certain methods are chosen. So I think uh, that would be important to me, but um, I can't tell you because I have no portfolio set up up to now. Yeah, what, what I also looked at was first off, um, a lot of people already failed when, they, when they're when they sending the CV, like where you see, okay, this is where I studied, this is where I worked with them, and it's layouted badly and you're applying for the sign job or it's... Uh, there was another great comment on the chat right now uh, from Christiane. Uh, she recommends to uh, focus on a story around it. Um, I think this is some good point, mm. but, and there comes the but, um, why should you tell a story? I think um, probably, you, probably you might focus on what you can do best. If you're more a storyteller, then focus on storytelling. If you're a kind of a researcher, put your focus on the research why you choose which method. So um, I think 
that also brings you to a point where you can really um, distinguish you from other uh, jobs. Uh, we, we already had the question before between UI uh, designer, UX researcher or something. And I think that's the point. And what I, um, we got application um, that we really liked. Um, it just, I didn't see it, I just got told, but I really liked the idea. It was like a task flow, or like a user flow, but why you should hire me. And it was like, um, are you looking for this? Yes. Um, are you looking for this too? Yes. And then at one point it went to, okay, then you should hire me. If you, and then you could either go in a negative route and say, okay, you don't need to hire me if you are, I don't know, if you don't do this or whatever, or you say all, all roads lead to, yes, hire me. So I, I thought it was nice to have a UX method included in the design of your CV. Uh, I, I think this is a really some some good points here. Um, if you have anything else you want to know about uh, how you can improve uh, yourself by self-taught things or on community base or maybe even something on uh, courses or uh, university studies or something, put it on the chat and we will uh, take it on stage and talk about it. And I think you wanted to ask me, by the way, um, <laughs> we, we talked about the script before, uh, about the university um, courses that I do. Yes, yes, <laughs> but, <laughs> but. Johannes, just just one thing. Um, Sadia, I hope the name is right, and I hope she's still here, but she's asking so many smart questions that I would really love to answer. And I think she can't hear us. She can't or she can't? No, she, she just uh, wrote on chat that she uh, can still, uh, can't still uh, hear us. So uh, maybe, probably, um, uh, Nico, you can type on a chat to Sadia if she's still, still here or write uh, her message in the meantime to um, maybe put some of the information on the UX education uh, part of the mirror board afterwards. So, uh, and she can still listen to the recording. Since we have a recording, uh, I think it's probably also a great way. And mm -hmm. for the recording, we will answer all the questions right now. Smart. Um, yes. How can you work effectively with a graphic designer? So for me, this would, mean, <laughs> this would mean as a UX designer, I'm handing over then to the UI designer. I, this is how I'm interpreting this now. Um, and I would say that it's very important that everybody in the team and the UI designer, the UX designer, the dev, um, all of the people in the team need to understand why certain decisions were made. So I always uh, explain to the UI designer um, the concept, what the user needs, everything behind it. So then also he will give me feedback on my UX concepts, like in this handover process, he will give me feedback and then when he's done with the UI concept, I will then give him feedback and so on. Um, so I think it's very valuable that everybody's on the same, um, has the same knowledge. I think um, just to wrap it up, it's the same as working with anyone on any other department or uh, other team. Uh, I think it's not different to uh, talk to a graphic designer than talking to uh, like the CEO or a developer. Um, you probably have to, um, ask the right questions or just ask uh, to get on the same page and then you can um, talk on the same level. Uh, it might be different somehow because uh, with the CEO you might not have this exchange, with a developer you might have, so uh, those are different and uh, you're maybe in the same process. But uh, talking and also getting feedback from one, uh, from each other uh, is also something that shows uh, the others uh, kind of a respectful um, um, interaction on the team. And especially uh, for UX teams of one, it's um, really important to, to be known and seen uh, different on the team. Um, I was sitting in the development department for the first five years at the company I'm working at. And uh, that was really helpful. So people got to know what I do actually, and also why I did that. And it's not, not just the mock-ups falling out 
all of a sudden, but it's really hard work behind it. So, um, and uh, I think that's also with graphic designers that always getting the feedback. And I was always there going to developers and asking also them about their experience, their uh, knowledge, and also if it's feasible, for example, because of course, at some point you can't tell, even if I am into development, I can't tell myself if it's feasible or not. This is why I also put in, even with the kids, I told them like verify, right? I told them verify, not only with the customer and with the user that you are on the right track at, at your certain points in time, but also with development. At, at some point, you know, okay, these things could be tricky, but at some, with some things, I, I'm just not sure. And at one point I just present the concept and then say, okay, feasible or not. And then we go to UI. So, um, or then I present it to the client, right? So yeah, like you said, respect that. Yeah, UX is a team effort. So it's not like you're working alone. Um, then right. Next, how and where next do you one. lock your work and define processes? Confluence. <laughs> <laughs> That's my answer. Sorry. Uh, okay, we we have uh, processes defined in um, Confluence. different. Uh, also, Confluence. It's only part of it. Uh, but we also have a QMS system, and we also um, have other processes defined. Uh, but basically, uh, how do I lock my work? Uh, since I have to deal a lot with uh, developers, I just. Uh, take the development uh, space. So uh, it's a team foundation server, uh, Jira, and also Confluence. And there I uh, mm -hmm. log everything. So um, that's how I uh, prioritize and uh, log my work. Uh, but I think it it's not the tool that we're talking about, but more uh, which process you are in. So if you're more closely connected to uh, like, uh, design, screen design team, I think it might be different tools than if you're uh, closer to a development team. You, you won't have a, a, like a, a team foundation server or something that you... Nope, we have, we have also Jira. <laughs> so um, it, it is the same a bit for, for designers and that's what I mean. Like you can, you can just learn from what Dev already does and what it does good, right? So um, how... Did you prioritize my work? Um, at the old company, that is a very good question. Actually, most of the time when somebody would come to my office twice, <laughs> you would get more priority. Um, otherwise, it was kind of hard to, um, to, to figure that out, but I always had to prioritize my own product, of course, first, then the other products and um, the, and the deadlines, of course, were also then from the development were also my priority. So, yeah. And some of the things where I thought, okay, if the developers would just do it by themselves, it would not be that critical. I also prioritized that um, lower, but if I knew it was something completely new where they, there was really um, a solid concept um, needed and research, then yeah, I prioritized it higher. Yeah, um, there are also some questions about transitioning from uh, one job into UX uh, without a formal UX degree or experience. And I think that's a really, really interesting question because there are a lot of people um, at the moment uh, transitioning uh, from um, uh, another field into UX or from uh, web design into UX or something. Mm -hmm. So. Um, that's something um, that is difficult. It highly depends on uh, the, uh, yeah, on the maturity of the um, company. Because if they are uh, more mature uh, with regards to UX, they might not look at degrees. They uh, might ask more questions about your personal experience and uh, maybe what other insights you have. And it highly depends on where you come from. Uh, because uh, a lot of UX methods, that's what I learned, uh, really coming from different fields. Uh, for example, if you look at design principles, uh, design prim 
principles come sometimes from the psychological uh, field, sometimes also from the architecture, uh, sometimes uh, from totally different areas, but uh, they're pretty much the same. So if you're coming from a different area, you might also bring some of the ideas, for example, with regards to um, some design principles or um, maybe some methods, because uh, especially research uh, is a lot of um, intersection to uh, psychological research. Uh, so you might know at some point uh, already uh, or have insights into what you access about. Mm -hmm. And um, so, I, I honestly, I, I personally would not care about any degree at all. I could not even, okay, there's some that I um, like, for example, when I see someone, ooh, psychology, I was like excited um, because I knew that we were missing this special um, uh, know-how in our team, right? When I was looking for something specific, then um i was maybe looking at this but i could not tell you exactly where all the people that i was working with um what what they studied and i would not care because i would check the work but the most important thing is the the talk the interview because there were people that were um so what is really important for me because like i said i think we are like the social glue <laughs> when you're doing an interview um you really have to get the information in a nice and polite way out of people, but you also are often in, in not, not a conflict situation, but you know, in a tricky situation between, um, between all the different parties and you have to be a mediator. So this social aspect is something that is very important. So I, I for example, I would not hire a very shy person because I would just be afraid that uh, developers would like um, eat the person, talking, not, not eat them, but when there's like discussion about a compromise, you know, sometimes you have to stand up for your concept and for the user. And yeah, yeah, but uh, that brings but, us to, yeah, but the second thing, yeah, although I'm not caring about this, I don't know about HR. So when you're in a big company, it could be that there are some, um, you know, HR would pre-filter in my old company would pre-filter based on your degree if you would even be um, selected and if your um, resume would even be forwarded. So it and would be that you not even forwarded. And I think um, in the field of UX, because uh, there are not uh, in all countries uh, already uh, prepared university studies. Uh, you might also get into the field with uh, some degree from a different um, study like interaction design, which is um, sometimes uh, the key or a uh, uh, psychology, or uh, you could also do some uh, certificates like the UX QCC um, certificate for, um, to get some degree, uh, which is one course and uh, one exam. So you have something in your hand um, if you're uh, really, really, um going into a larger company and um i think that's uh right what you said if you have an hr they might uh, pre-filter based on uh experience based on uh, certificates based on uh, any university degree mm. and so I'm not um, sure about that i know our hr is, is now in the new company is not like that but i know in the old company it was very disconnected uh, from the actually partners. Yeah, but uh, you mentioned earlier what, what you really like about the job and uh, that you like to talk to each other. And there was one question also about this transitioning, what uh, our favorite parts and not so favorite parts in our job are. Um, I think uh, what was mentioned very often, um, the favorite parts is really this uh, interaction. It's also within the global UX community where I somehow fell in uh, you get to know people really quick. If you're uh, kind of a chatty person and always into meetups or events like this, or uh, going to bar camps and uh, just be there. You, you are um, usually, uh, people are really friendly there and welcome you and uh, you, you don't get any 
negative feedback there, uh, just uh, something that you can take away and learn from. So it's not like you did this wrong. It's more like uh, probably you might uh, think about this and uh, probably you find a different way for yourself. So it's not wrong, uh, but it's something that I wouldn't do more like this. And it's really like that. It's not meant to be something that is wrong. It's it's uh, mostly uh, that, that people are uh, talking about their own experience and what they really would do. And um, I really like this part of the job to have this uh, team effort, which I try to get to some point, even if I'm only one UX designer in the company, but I team up with uh, other departments and talk to them like they were UX designers and treat them like that <laughs> somehow. It's a, it's a really good question, though. I never really thought about this. I think all of the points that I love about the job, I also hate about the job sometimes. Um, it would be, you're always talking with people. That's great. But sometimes, like I said the other day, I don't want to talk to people today, but, but you can't, right? Um, also, what I really like is that it's a really new field. So you can, um, it feels like there's so many new things that you can learn, so many new things that you can find out. Um, but on the other hand, this also means that maybe your responsibility and your role is not really clear in a company. And you really need to define that when you start somewhere. Um, and where is, uh, where does your role end and where does the PM start? Where does your role end and the tester start, right? It's like uh, UX, we placed ourselves in there and um, yeah, still, still a bit hard to decide where where actually the next role starts uh, for me at least. Or it's every time a li little bit different. What I dislike sometimes is uh, that people want to force me into arguing about uh, why to uh, actually invest into UX um, because I don't want to argue about why to UX. Um, I always try to turn it the other way around. Uh, so they ask themselves why not to turn in uh, to to uh, 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 invest in UX. Uh, and this is really difficult for a not a very mature uh, company. But uh, I think uh, that we are doing pretty well right now. Connie, you can say that from an external perspective uh, because you're working with our company right now. <laughs> um, what, what do you say about our UX maturity and uh, the um, investment or how they are um, considering UX? Is it treated? better than in your old company? Because you oh. have to compare it to your old oh, yeah. company since yeah, both are B2B, so. Yeah, um, 100%, I have to say. Um, I, for example, when we're having dailies together, um, our team and, and your team, I do not feel a very strong disconnect, right? I feel like, like I said, we're talking the same language and this is the, the base that everybody knows what is, what is important and why it's important. And like you said before, um, arguing why you need to do your job is such a futile effort that just makes no sense. And I would recommend just switch your job, change your job because um, it is taking so much energy. As it took so much energy for me um, because I just saw where all the money was going. I saw how we spend it wrong i saw how we had like 200 people testing but only one person making a concept um and it was um yeah frustrating right um so i feel with you <laughs> all all the way <laughs> telling um, me what what we do wrong all the time <laughs> and i think that all the people that we are actually working with they then understand the value of ux and they see okay Last time we developed it four times or 15 times, and now we just did it once and we we hit the target better. We got closer. Uh, it doesn't mean that we are always 100% right, but um, this maybe one week that you spend for research, where you're doing interviews, where you're doing this pre-work could save you like six months later on. A one week of design sprint can save you uh, six months of arguing. Um, getting everybody on the table, just having a concept that everybody sees and agrees on before you start to code. 
like these tiny things, right? Um, because otherwise, so so often it happens like six months in the project, and then somebody says, uh, "Not what we wanted." Um, and yeah, back to the drawing board. And this also fits to the question: like, did you feel you could influence the processes? In I was just company. thinking the same, uh, just from my perspective, uh, because I'm in the situation that uh, Connie was in the last company right now, and I think I am influencing the processes, and uh, you feel it also from an outside perspective. But uh, Connie, uh, how was the situation in your previous company? Um, yeah, like I said, the first four years, you know, I was young, I was motivated, I was burning myself out. Um, I in, in four years, I managed um, to influence it that much that it would have one other full-time resource. And then it worked quite fast because management changed a bit. Um, and then I think we were then eight full-time employees when I, when I left the company, but it was still too slow. And it was still, I felt 1% of the company understood the value and I, I just knew I had two options now. Either I keep fighting and I will have a burnout in probably a year, um, or my other option would be that I just resign. I do my nine to five job. I go to work. I just do whatever they ask me, although it doesn't make sense. Although it's maybe just polishing the UI or doing a bit of UX. Um, and then just go home, work my eight hours and go home. But I knew I wouldn't be happy with that. So. I think your decision to uh, switch to another company was right. I also think so, yeah. But yeah, I think I could influence. I, um, it takes a lot of effort. Depend. I had 11, now seven management um, hierarchies above me. Um, so, and I was on the lowest and trying to influence something from that point was really difficult. So you can influence, but it's, it's hard. And if management is, does not have, a... okay, an example, uh, we had a new product owner join us <clears throat> at Parkset and yeah, and he asked. Uh, he asked me if I could explain him what I'm doing, what we're doing as UX, um, what we're, how the process is looking like, because I, they did UX, but not specifically in his old company, and he would like to know about it. And I was so happy because in my old company, no product manager would ever um, say something like that. Like, I don't know, please please tell me and actively come to me. Um, so I really love it when people just say, I don't know, tell me. And where you really have to take care is when people think they know, but they don't, because this is what I had in the upper management. When I left, I said, <clears throat> because um, um, I said, long story short, I wrote to, the CEO I wrote um, and to one below I wrote look um, this is what I did in the last eight years in this company and UX is really important and before I'm leaving um, I love this company I'm really sad that I'm leaving but um, you should really do this and this and this and please hire at least three people because it's really necessary the products are going to become more and more and more and it's going to become more complex and um, you need this and this would be really important and as a feedback I got back um, actually in a completely other department um, there would be a system designer software that could maybe take over a bit of your job and I was like <clears throat> I see we are not talking the same language. Um, goodbye, sir. And I just didn't even reply. So. Yep. But I think think that uh, all really, really great points that, that you point out. And um, especially that you, um, even if you already knew you leave, uh, just 
get back to the people uh, shows how you're into the UX design thinking uh, because it's never about you. It's always about the users and uh, how the product can be improved to fulfill uh, the needs for the tasks. And um, that's something I, I uh, really like about. Also, uh, the first talk and session at UX Grads that you did was about uh, building this uh, UX team or getting from the team of one to uh, actually a team in your previous company. Um, and that was amazing for people who just started in the field of UX. So, um, Really it was great a point. To look back and like, yeah, actually, you know, something changed. Um, also, sometimes we maybe don't realize how much uh, it is that we are maybe changing or that actually happened. So that was also good for me, Johannes. Yeah, uh, you're welcome. Um, always uh, glad to see uh, people join their experience or just. Uh, also, and that's what uh, I uh, still try to uh, achieve because um, a lot of uh, junior designers um, are afraid of uh, talking at uh, meetup groups or uh, at communities. And I don't know why, because um, if you go there and just share what you did or maybe also uh, bring in your own projects and ask others about to just uh, bring it into open discussions is so amazing. It's, it's really insightful for all uh, perspectives. Also for people who are working in the field for a long time already to get a fresh view on something that you thought you already knew, but not in this perspective. And that's why I always try to find people who are not in the field as long as uh, some others are and uh, also share their um, insights or uh, smaller projects they are currently working on and maybe also ask for feedback. So you get into discussions and uh, really think about uh, maybe uh, things that you are just doing your own way, but in the discussion of a project that uh, someone with um, not too much experience in the field of UX uh, has, uh, also brings up discussions uh, between um, people who are in the field for many, many years because they all never thought about it again. They just did it, but all in a different way. And then you suddenly realize that you might also need to consider some things that you assumed. And I think that's the word you were looking for <laughs> before. Uh, it's not about assumptions. Um, if, if people tell you, um, and uh, I always get this with our user stories, when, when they tell uh, the user uh, wants to do this or that, it's mostly based on assumptions and not um, as you would do in UX about um, uh, validation of uh, what you're really doing. So yeah. that's, that's really kind of the difference that you have. I, I'd always, um, <laughs> in German it's, I. I, I believe, right? I don't, I think it would be in English or whatever, more say, I think um, the user would do this and that. But I always say we're, we're not in church. Um, this is no place for believing. If we don't know, we need to go back and do research. Um, so it is 100% like you're saying, um, no no place for believing in, in research. It's, it's, it's facts and that's what I actually, that is something that I also like about the job because it's designing, but it is also um, rules. And I'm a fan of processes and rules and um, and my confluence and so on. And it is designing by rules. It's not, sometimes you see art, okay, I'm also painting, right? But you're like, mm, I don't know if I like it or why I like it, but with UX, it works, right? It, it either works or, or it doesn't, so it's, I, I just when you when you were talking about rules, I was just thinking about uh, another thing that's very important uh, to get people to uh, be creative, and that's constraints. Uh, because if you get constraints, uh, don't fight them. Uh, because if you're inside of them, you really have to be creative to reach a certain uh, quality. So um, this is nothing that is bad. If there are too many of them, uh, you might get caught in a trap somewhere. But uh, at least some constraints are really important because uh, you really have to find, um, I don't know, some other way to work it out. 
Now yeah, constraints also have to be creative, right? You can't you can't be creative um, in in a void where everything's possible. Um, so yeah, I, I get where you're coming from. Um, there's one one more question. I think we already answered it a bit. Um, with so many tools, programs to learn as a junior UX designer, how do you know the basic ones to start with? Figma, Adobe XD, et cetera. I it's love the, know what to focus on to learn on your own. I love the job post where it says you have to have 10 or 15 years of experience with Adobe XD. That's that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I read that, um, oh, no. I read that <laughs> recently right and, and probably no one has um, because it uh, had a different name before in development stage and it came out uh, how many years? 17 or 18? <laughs> <laughs> Somehow. So, and, and, and that's how you see um, how uh, HR people are writing uh, sometimes job descriptions. So, yeah. Um, but actually, I would say when you're starting, just take the one where you're not paying um, because they're so similar um, yeah. and check the ones where you like the tutorials better. Um, it, it doesn't matter. There is so... Especially if you're not going into depth. If you're really uh, working and collaborating with a team, um, then you have some differences, but that's the best way to learn with the team and not alone um, because they might have some uh, processes already set up uh, where you uh, how, where and how you communicate um, how to set up different versions of a file and so on and so forth so um, yeah get the free tool work with it so you know the basics agree on that and I also um, I, I'm um, teaching at the University of Paso uh, the, uh, the X Foundation uh, course, and I always ask the students to uh, draw with paper and pen the first drafts, and they hate me for it. Um, <laughs> what is it like? Did paper get a, get get uncool? I swear, I was I was so um, so scared when. Uh, uh, or I, I was a bit ashamed because when they said paper, are you sure? Um, the students like paper, it's really, really old school. And I'm like, luckily you're not seeing below this screen now because it was remote because like my, my whole desk is paper. Like everywhere there's there's paper because this is how I, how I work, how I sketch, how I design. Um, I even print my digital designs out so that I can then um, make comments on them because I just like the feeling of it, and then I go to my colleagues and discuss. Yeah, yeah you with your fake paper, it's the expensive paper. <laughs> but um, w when I had my course last, no, this year, um, it was remote. So the students thought, uh, because they knew it from the past, that they have to draw on paper, and they thought mm -hmm. it's remote. So how can you? he asked us to draw on paper. And we had a session from um, a tool called Wizard with one of our meetups, which is uh, basically doing something uh, to grab the designs that you draw on paper and creates uh, low or high fee uh, uh, fit, uh, prototypes out of it. So you scan them, just put them in. And I was talking to one of the um, co-founders, uh, if he can uh, give me some some discount for educational purpose. And he said, well, you get it for free. And then I was going to the students and say, okay, well, we do it on paper. And you just take a photo and upload it and we have it there. So um, disappointed students, but they really <laughs> enjoyed to, to use the tool afterwards. Uh, you always find a way to use paper. But um, Connie, are you hanging around on uh, one of the lounge tables um, afterwards? Because I think I might close the session now and uh, you can join one of the other sessions. Um, we also posted our LinkedIn uh, yeah, accounts. Right. Quickly copy paste them um, so they are not lost uh, when I close the session. Um, if you I go... Uh, hi, Patrick. Uh, launch tables. Uh, if you go back outside, there is um, on the uh, top bar uh, something that says uh, like sessions, uh, reception and launch. And in the launch area, you have tables where you can just uh, take a seat 
and have a chat together uh, with a smaller group of persons. So uh, probably, Connie, you can hang around on some of the tables so uh, people can still join you. I unfortunately have to prepare some other sessions uh, as well, so I'll not be around there too much, but feel free to reach out and hopefully we meet each other at uh, some meetup somehow. Um, yeah, so thanks again for your really amazing talk, Connie. And thanks for the nice chat afterwards. Great chat, so I really learned something about you as well that I didn't know before. <laughs> and we <laughs> will- I'm so talkative, how, how are there things that you're not knowing about me? <laughs> so you find Connie and she will tell you everything afterwards um, about our amazing UX grad sessions and uh, why she originally decided to uh, join me on this crazy adventure. <laughs> <laughs> because you were so persistent. <laughs> That's, that's the secret. The secret of the UX designer being persistent. Okay, then thank you. Um, have thank you. a great day, night. Uh, We're still uh, continuing until, um, let's see, for um, about eight hours it's ongoing. So two thirds are done from 24 hours of UX, uh, one third still um, ongoing. Uh, meet you at another session. I will be around somewhere, somehow. <laughs> eventually, with a lot of coffee inside. Thank you, Johannes. Thank you, and... Thank uh, you for listening. Goodbye. Bye.